hello this is my first sort of video uh, or more of an audio recording really like I usually write on the blog um, La Verde Planedo um, but today I just sort of wanted to briefly discuss the uh, book um, Silent Spring by Rachel Carlson um, yeah which has been quite a historically sort of influential book uh, particularly on the environmental movement um, I'm still in the process of reading the book currently, but I'm nearing the end. And initially I wanted to do a sort of more thorough discussion and a, uh, maybe even like bits and pieces like a review, kind of in the style of um, the Radical Reviewer on YouTube. But um, I sort of realised that I don't really have the capacity or the sort of time and resources, etc. to do a, um, a proper sort of discussion the way I, that I would have liked to. So instead I'm just sort of going to um, start talking about some brief thoughts and ideas that I had about the book and that I'm continuing to have while uh, reading it. Um, for a bit of context, um, in case, well yeah, this uh, is going to sort of, this discussion is going to sort of assume that you've read the book for a lot of it or you're going to sort of have access to a book to sort of verify what I'm saying, like I'm representing the book properly, but it's not too important if you haven't seen it, I suppose. But um, for a bit of context, um, the book was written after um, she, uh, Rachel Carlson received a letter from a friend uh, who um, had found um, several dead birds after um, uh, DDT was sprayed um, over her local area via planes in order to um, combat um, mosquito populations. And then um, uh, Carson, I think I called her Carlson earlier, but um, it's Carson, I think. Uh, Carson, um, she uh, sort of had been wanting to write about insecticides and stuff for quite a long time and pesticides, but uh, she never really received the support from the things. Uh, Carson, um, uh, yeah, a bit of background for who she was. She was a uh, marine biologist, but uh, like before she became a marine biologist, she'd been studying to become a writer. And then uh, she'd been wanting to be a writer since a, uh, being a young child. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, she decided to get into marine biology. Well, I think she went for more generally zoology and then ended up becoming a marine biology simply because she needed a quick career with the US um, what, a re a department within the US government because uh, um, she needed to help uh, pay for her family um, during the um, Great Depression. But uh, yeah, her father was an insurance salesman, and then uh, yeah, that's Carson is. But um, yeah, Carson's sort of been credited as sort of because uh, she wrote even before Silent Spring, she wrote a lot of influential uh, books on particularly uh, elements of like marine ecosystems and ocean ecosystems and uh, the conservation of the seas. And then uh, that in turn was after I'm um, doing a brief sort of radio program on uh, this stuff. But uh, she's been credited as sort of like uh, one of the f most influential figures in sort of the deep ecology sort of movement and ecofeminism, even though she didn't herself seem to be overly involved in the feminist movement. But I think this has sort of come about because, um, well, she had a um, very strong sort of uh, well, it's been confirmed, like, we know for definite it was a really strong friendship, but it was a potential romantic attraction uh, between, uh, or even relationship between um, a close friend of hers, uh, but that hasn't been confirmed, and uh, it is, it's just simple that uh, it, it could be the case that they just use sort of this sort of romantic overtones when writing to each other, but we're just good friends. We don't know, and it's unfair to sort of say, but... Um, uh, yeah, so basically Carson uh, published this book after, wrote this book after doing the letter, but um, she, uh, um, yeah, she got a lot of, uh, she got a lot of scientists to support what she was saying, because um, she and her f uh, the people that she helped contact to research and write the book, they were very concerned, of course, about the um, influence of the big chemical companies who would then sort of... Um, intervene and like sue her for libel and of course um unfortunately at the time she was um very ill with um cancer well well when it was nearing publishing uh so um as part of this preemptive thing they've got a, they got a large body of scientists to um read over the work 
and then that 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 gives me a bit more uh, confidence actually with it because um one thing that i noticed and that that's just sort of one thing i've picked up on um uh through sort of watching various science shows and stuff i'm not professionally academically trained by any measure but um from just sort of reading around and watching videos is um one problem that i see uh f well that i see in the work is that animal studies uh which of course is because it's a bit unethical to um directly test humans and uh well, it's a bit unethical to directly test animals, but this was, of course, the book was published in 1962. So uh, things were a bit different then, and people didn't really consider animal welfare as strongly as, well, um, some people uh, rightfully do. But um, uh, where was I? Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. You can tell how informal this discussion is going to be already. But um, yeah, um, uh, where she used animal studies in... She does use human case studies throughout the thing, and then she does explain why the animal studies are related, could be um, applied to humans. But a lot of the effects, um, particularly with genetic modification in uh, one of the later chapters, uh, it uses animal studies. And of course, there's the problem where um, animals are not humans, and certain animals may be more se sensitive to um, pesticides than um, humans would be. But. Um, uh, like I said, uh, she got a large number of scientists to look over and uh, write, uh, uh, verify and sort of give it their sort of approval. So that, that, that gives me a bit more confidence as a reader. Um, she's been accused, uh, particularly by um, a lot of uh, uh, chemical companies and chemists and stuff, um, who did actually, although I'm not too sure if they actually tried to sue her for Libel, they... Um, I hope I'm saying that right, Libel. I've only ever read the word, to be entirely honest. But, um, uh, yeah, uh, they did sort of threaten a lot of organisations and uh, publications that uh, supported the Silent Spring. Uh, so, uh, and then one of the accusations that were frequently um, raised against um, uh, Rachel Carson was um, that she was overly emotional. And I think that's simply just because... Uh, uh, Carson was a very good writer, like things uh, very beautifully and um, in the book and then the way she writes it's um, Silent Springs being one of the scariest books I suppose especially when she talks about like um, how these chemicals could easily end up in the thing and affecting, uh, affecting everything really and she describes it in, a, in an almost poetic fashion but they accused her of being um, too emotional and I suppose that's again why she's an influential figure in the eco feminist movement because this whole sort of there's been historically this idea that um women who are emotional they're obviously not being rational and um the, these emotional responses they're perfectly normal responses and the people who are criticizing people for being overly emotional they're in a position of privilege they don't necessarily feel so sort of ah to put it in an expressive term like um for example i'm more in likely to get emotional about the fact that a person is pointing a gun to my head and then being like, you shouldn't do that. And he, he might then turn around and say, um, well, there's no, well, obviously you're not thinking clearly about whether or not I should shoot you because you're, because you're letting your emotions get in the way with it. So, and then, um, yeah, but this argument's being more applied, unfortunately, to women and, and, um, people of color and other marginalized, uh, groups which is quite unfortunate, so I, but I think, yeah, despite the sort of criticism, it did massively raise um, public awareness of um, environmental issues and, uh, and uh, pesticides in general, and it helped for a lot of um, pushback against it. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I think a lot of reviewers uh, on the back of the book, it talks about um, how... Uh, Carson, and then um, also in the introduction, the preface, um, uh, Carson brought ecology to the public attention with like ecology being the um, the sort of understanding of the interconnectedness of all living things. I think, uh, yeah, this book was quite popular in sort of more left-leaning uh, circles and environmentalist circles, especially like um, just to look at the introduction and the preface. Um, the, int uh, the introduction and the preface uh, for me were, well, I've 
I'm in Britain, so it's for a British audience, but the introduction was written by Lord Shackleton, who, um, for a bit of context, he was a geographer. He was the son of um, the expeditioner, Ernest Shackleton, and he, he kept up his um, father's sort of tradition of sort of being involved in ex expeditions of both uh, sort of before and the end of his political career, which I'll now sort of explain, because um, he was involved in the military during the, I believe it was Second World War, uh, could have been the first, I'm not too sure, uh, but he was the, he was um, involved in the RAF and he received some sort of uh, commendation for that, but he was a Labour politician and a um, minister of, uh, he, uh, as a Labour politician he was eventually made Minister of Defence and eventually was put into the House of Lords. Um, in case you're not from Britain, Labour's sort of a left-leaning party it was more left-leaning probably in Shackleton's time but I don't think there's any sort of indication that Shackleton himself was a socialist by any means and but um, Labour at the time was more sort of leaning to the left, left centre like um, what would nowadays be referred to as maybe um, social democrat or um, at least, um, well, if you're using American terms, um, uh, li a liberal, uh, but um, at least. But um, yeah, he sort of talks about how, um, to quote him, start quote, Silent Spring is not merely about poisons, it is about ecology, end quote. Yeah, I have quotes from the introduction and pretty face where I first tried starting writing a more thorough um uh, discussion but yeah he's he, he's when he's talking about the um importance of ecology and then but yeah he's quite a left-wing person tell you what um instead of then talking about the person who wrote the preface i'll discuss the introduction briefly to sort of because i think it sort of sets the theme for the rest of the book and it's something that i'm then going to move into discussion about but uh to start another quote um there's start quote man is an animal and indeed the most important of all animals end quote so you can see there, there's sort of the understanding that um, humanity is not necessarily separate or isolated from the natural world and its effects, but there's this sort of idea that it's above it and sort of superior to it, and that's what I think's quite problematic. And it, it is something that um, it goes into detail in more in the book, but I'll explain that a bit um, uh, later. Uh, with the introduction, there's some some other things I picked up, uh, but um, and I think this is quite interesting. Is maybe um, it talks about um, pesticide use in the in Britain, which um, according to Lord Shackleton, um, sort of, of course, it still happened, and he uh, describes fox death, which occurred um, well in 1959. He describes how um, 1,300 foxes were found dead, and then uh, there were many um, sick individuals. Uh, who were dazed, hypersensitive to noise, dying and dying of thirst with uh, no fear of humans. And this was attributed to um, uh, pesticide poisoning. And then um, during the period of 1960 to 1962, there were many uh, dead birds found, which uh, pr uh, resulted in ornithological organisations and uh, NGOs uh, pressuring the parliament to adopt a voluntary agreement to stop um, s the seeds being dressed by uh, pest pesticides um, but uh, out outside of situations where there was a seriously anticipated risk uh, to the crop and even then it could only be done in autumn uh, but uh, spraying still sort of uh, continued and then in um, one instance they did uh, took a look at 740 eggs a uh, few a uh, very few hatched and amongst the unhatched eggs there was like large amounts of them um, contained mercury and BHC. But, uh, and then he mentions uh, peregrines uh, disappearing from southern England. And yeah, with the birds, that's sort of what we know a lot more, because um, yeah, our birds of prey populations in Britain, they did sort of get decimated by um, pesticide use, because what would happen is um, if the birds weren't killed, uh, of course there's bioaccumulation, because um, uh, the uh, pesticides and Carson uh, describes this throughout the book, but um, they accumulate in adipose tissues, so the fatty tissues, and then because they sort of accumulate in these tissues, uh, they concentrate up a um, chain in the food web. So like, for example, um, a bird might eat a bunch of poison seeds, but because it's eating them and they're accumulating uh, in the fat, it might have then a great quantity of 
um, pesticides within it, which, and then a uh, bird of prey would come along, eat the smaller birds, and then it's eating many examples of those things with high quantities of fat even in them. So it accumulates upwards, and then uh, if these birds of prey weren't killed outright, uh, they would uh, either be rendered infertile or there'd be problems with the development of the eggs. So they would go to sort of brood their eggs, but the eggs, unfortunately, the uh, shells would be soft and the um, parents would unfortunately um, kill their, uh, well, destroy the eggs. So that resulted in mass devastation of um, pretty much... Uh, nearly all species of birds of prey and of course the uh, birds low on the food chains who were sort of getting the less concentrated but the uh, uh, still a f uh, simply through vast amounts of pesticide uh, the only sort of birds of prey that sort of uh, fared a bit better were ones that sort of uh, preyed upon um, uh, small mammals as opposed to um, uh, small birds because uh, mammals accumulated um, less of the fats in their tissues they I I'm not too sure the reason I think it's because they have more effective kidneys or um or a, a liver uh, when dealing with these sort of issues so the accumulation wasn't too bad and then they were sort of able to move into the empty sort of niches left by the um, decimated pop the, the more heavily decimated populations but yeah it was interesting to sort of read Shackleton sort of saying because um he says there hasn't been uh such uh a um uh destruction but uh yeah he also describes how in the 1950s uh he uh start quote commercial interest end quote uh tried to persuade highway authorities to sort of use um herbicides on uh hedgerows and uh but uh an NGO the Nature Conservancy uh mostly was able to block this um, with the support of a great number of naturalists but um experimental and strictly limited use was uh, still permitted even though this thing and we can sort of see this is uh, another example of sort of leading in how the introduction says stuff that sort of gets exploring themes that i might see later but um we will discuss later but um uh, the idea of sort of th there is sort of this recognition that um, capitalism is responsible for uh, and the capitalist system and the um, interests that uh, that it creates are not necessarily beneficial and in fact harmful like we see um, the commercial interest trying to make a profit by uh, persuading the highway authorities to use herbicides despite their massive risks and then um, uh, Shackleton also has um, concerns about health risks which are explored later in the thing, and he, he quotes the uh, Chester Beatty, uh, I hope I'm saying that right, Chester Beatty Institute, which is now the Institute of uh, Cancer Research, uh, how that sort of disputed a lot of the official um, declarations of these, uh, the safety of such uh, pesticides. And then there's been, a, he says that action has sort of been taken, and he has, as you can see, he is not like far to the right, because he, or not far to the right, uh, far to the left, because, uh, um, he talk, he's quite supportive of the government uh, committees who were attempting to prevent the poisoning of agricultural workers. And then he says, the same is true also of uh, the chemical companies, end quote. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, you can see he is quite sympathetic to uh, corporations and governments. Yeah, but he, he's also more of the... Uh, I'd say he's actually probably less concerns to about the herbicide issues than the person who writes the preface who I'll get into now and then Carson herself um because he says uh you need uh, that we need to sort of uh start quote to look at both sides of the coin end quote uh uh because he um believes that uh, pesticides are sort of more necessary than maybe the others two would argue uh and he uses sort of the Irish famine to defend this and I found that quite a bad example because although it was sort of this uh, pest disease that then uh, ruined most of the potato crop and caused this famine that did kill uh, uh, um, like an unforgivably large amount of people uh, this sort of death toll was mostly because uh, well most of the crops got ruined because they were sort of grown as sort of a monoculture of mo mostly a single variety of um, uh, of potato but also 
it ignores that um, uh, potatoes weren't the only crop grown in Ireland and there was a lot of food around that could have been uh, given to the Irish people to stop them from starving to death, but instead it was exported to, again, um, capital interests. Uh, resulting in um, great devastation. Um, so um, then, uh, and then another thing that I found interesting in the introduction is he talks about how sort of particularly the aristocracy were actually quite supportive of the uh, the anti pesticide movement. Um, I think he quotes the Duke of Edinburgh and a, um, a prince from the Netherlands. Uh, the preface, on the other hand, it was uh, written by um, Julian Huxley. Uh, Huxley was a prominent humanist, so very secular, and he was the grandson of Thomas Huxley, who was sort of Darwin's key supporter. Um, Julian Huxley, he, he was left-wing, and he was um, more, very much more left-wing than Lord Shackleton, but he was sort of, uh, again, um, he's not like an eco-anarchist, even though he had a deep love for nature, and he, was, he spent most of his time researching nature. He was... Um, he was very much had a vested interest in the status quo and the the government and stuff like that, and he was um, very supportive of uh, being uh, of a planned economy. He was a planned economist, and he sort of developed uh, his um, sort of favorable attitudes to planned economies after a visit to the USSR. Though he didn't necessarily, um, for example, worship the SSR or idolize it too much. Uh, he was, for example, a prominent of uh, 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 a pro opponent of Lysenko, who um, was an individual who was heavily promoted by the um, Soviet Union, but um, he rejected um, Mendelian ge genetics and a lot of the elements of Darwin's theory of evolution, and his doing so led to um, plans being implemented that exacerbated the um, famines under Stalin. Uh, but I think sort of this idea of sort of left wing and being into planned economics, it sort of reflects who he was because he was sort of an avid lover of nature, but he and an opponent of sort of capitalism. But he still had very uh, capitalistic sort of views of, of, on resources and sort of believing that there's sort of very much a scarcity, a finite sort of amount of resources and people can't necessarily be trusted to uh, deal with these um such scarcity themselves and because of this he was uh, a very prominent uh, supporter of eugenics. He wasn't so much into eugenics because um, of the race elements. He, he did not he, he was he did not believe in race. I think he called it a useless concept and uh, but he was very much into sort of population control which we, it does usually end up being racist or at least at least uh, perpetuating colonial and uh, racist attitudes. Because, um, well, of course, it's sort of this idea of, well, um, it's up to the poor and the people who have been marginalised and exploited to stop having children, even though with simply a better distribution of resources, there, there'd be no need for them to um, control their populations. And in any case, it should not necessarily be up to the poorest, most um, vulnerable uh, people on the planet to um, make up for the uh, destructive practices of the um, wealthier, more, more privileged members of society. Uh, but yeah, he, he was a strong proponent of uh, population control. Um, oh yeah, if you want more arguments against population control, I think there's a, a short little booklet called uh, Too Many of Whom, uh, Too Much of What, or the other way around. But um, yeah, anyway... Um, uh, Huxley uh, believed in a, an inferior working class as well. He believed like in the superiority of the aristocracy. Well, not necessarily the aristocracy, but the intelligentsia. Uh, but he he believed that this inferiority of the working class, although it would need to be managed by population control, he didn't believe it was sort of too inherent to them. He uh, as he sort of advocated for better standards of living. But I sort of explore this because I think this again falls into. Um, why he then sort of starts talking about the uses of um, optimum use, uh, and, uh, yeah, start quote, optimum use, end quote, and uh, start quote, optimum, uh, optimum um, conservation, end quote, of uh, resources. Because again, he has this very um, 
sort of weird view that of like exacerbated um scarcity and the sort of the fragileness of the natural worlds so i think his actually views are more similar to the uh, deep ecology than uh carson carson's more of sort of what murray butchkin would probably consider to be an environmentalist as opposed to a deep ecologist because um it's well from what my understanding deep ecology is more sort of this idea that sort of then leads into primitivism where uh man's a burden and he, he's consuming too much uh resources sorry i'm using man and he because i've just been reading silent spring and this was the sort of language that was used in that book but um humanity and they rather um is uh using too much resources and a burden on a sort of pristine natural world whereas environmentalism is sort of again it's a view that um the uh world sort of the environment's valuable but it's valuable in that uh, humanity needs it and it's only valuable because we can dominate and exploit it for stuff i don't think uh, carson would have used the terms of course exploit or dominate but there is sort of that relationship there like we uh, she assesses things based on their economic value and um their value to uh humans as opposed to its own sort of inherent view and there's very much this idea of although we're interconnected to nature and reliant upon it there is still sort of this huge distinction between humanity and nature but um yeah um this pulls into Huxley um Huxley yeah he then also talks about the idea of um the balance of nature uh, he calls it a dynamic balance, and I don't know whether he means that in a way, because Carson also talks about a uh, balance of nature, and that's quite a problematic concept, because it either leads people to believe that um, uh, nature is this um, super fragile thing that needs protecting, and that we're, any sort of disturbances uh, that we make to it are going to ruin everything, or it makes people believe that it's sort of invulnerable, and that this balance will be restored. But, uh, yeah... Um, yeah, uh, Carson describes it as sort of a shifting balance. So it, it's a balance, but it's constantly changing. Like she says, it's not the same sort of balance that existed during the Pleistocene, for example, and that it's constantly shifting. And then I think that's more into sort of Butchin's idea of social ecology, like uh, nature's uh, constantly changing. It's constantly getting more complex and more diverse. Uh, but uh, Butchkin would differ from Carson and Huxley in that he would say that there's more sort of um hu as humanity is inherently from nature and a part of nature it can then sort of play a role in influencing na uh, ecology and nature for the better to sort of consciously drive this unraveling of complexity and diversity in a more beneficial and directed manner uh huxley uh yeah he sort of is very much a deep ecologist but he sort of then has this conflict where he's quite a humanist um uh thing where he, he has this idea so it's kind of like a mix of he has like the elements of deep ecology and that he sees man as a bird and exploiting the world's resources but he sort of believes that man uh sorry humanity uh um humanity has the right to be exploiting these things i'll say his views on population control though um uh, from what I can gather, it was actually quite a common view in leftist circles at the time. So I don't know how much of this is um, Huxley. And then Huxley does show his sort of anti-capitalist nature because he, he does blame um, the mass campaign uh, for uh, chemical control as being a result of the profit motive. He directly says that, the, uh, the profit motive. And then he criticises how it sort of make, uh, makes everything overly quantitative uh though i i would argue that huxley himself puts an overly quantitative uh has an overly quantitative uh approach uh because he, he's thinking of things in terms of resources and allocation and stuff like that but yes yeah, so i think i've already sort of very much introduced a lot of the stuff that i would like to sort of discuss uh yeah, I've sort of discussed some of the problems that might arise scientifically with Carson's work, but I think I more want to sort of explore sort of this anti-capitalist, uh, anti-capitalism in the book that, um, 
doesn't quite go far enough. Like, um, Carson never really has a leftist perspective, per se. Uh, she, like, quite often, she makes it clear that, um, sort of, it's not necessarily an individual's fault because there's so much going against every individual, even though she talks about individuals sort of buying um, herbicides for their gardens and stuff like that. She never, ever sort of blames and say, like, oh, we need to cut our consumption of herbicides, or she might do it near the end of the book, but which I haven't quite read yet. But uh, so far, she hasn't said uh, said anything about that, but uh, like, in that sort of manner. But um, instead, it's sort of this idea that the public are very much being misled by larger forces. And she talks a lot about the bureaucracy of government that sort of uh, makes it very difficult to effectively allocate resources to ensuring the safety of the application of pesticides or even the, uh, the blatant ignorance of knowledge about the danger of pesticides by um, government agents, uh, agencies like the agricultural or even the forestry sort of government industries. And um, and then also she's quite critical of the uh, large chemical corporations as she's very aware of how they've been deliberately uh, misleading people into um, buying these um, dangerous uh, substances and uh, or government officials in using these substances. And then she, she does note a lot of... Uh, this dangerous thing, but she never really commits herself to sort of saying, uh, to see, understanding or seeing the, um, or stating the, um, overwhelming how this is all sort of put forward by this sort of capitalist system and how it does, like Huxley said, with its profit motive, um, sort of promote the exploitation of, uh, short, yeah, the short term exploitation of resources, which ultimately, um, ruins uh, things in the long term but it gets the short term uh, profits which are necessarily to remain competitive on the market like um, for example if I was to uh, own a really big business and then I decided oh I'm not going to invest use these herbicides and instead I'm going to um, spend 10 years researching a more sustainable option in that time um, uh, another company would be able to move in make a large profit off the use of herbicides and uh, raise uh, barriers in the marketplace and uh, shift uh, demand and supply to sort of then um, benefit themselves, which would then eventually uh, result in me being unable to continuously make profits and I would be excluded from the uh, marketplace. But yeah, um, Carlson doesn't really deal with it and she's still very much a promo proponent of sort of economic things like she very much talks instead about the uh she talks about like the values and how like people have a right to enjoy uh, the aesthetic pleasures of nature but a lot of her focus is on the economics uh but again there's uh, one could argue that there is also an equally um large focus on um health issues and the health issues call uh to both uh, people and the environment caused by pesticides and those I actually would agree have a larger focus but again there's this sort of idea that uh, we're doing things in an uneconomically uh, rational way and uh, she... another thing I'd say that she sort of fails to take into consideration though um, not many people have began taking this into consideration until sort of the first sort of um, arisal of the field of welfare biology and uh, well, uh, more investigation into wild animal suffering, but um, she 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 doesn't really uh, she promotes this sort of idea of a pristine nature, and she'll sort of she, in her poetic way describe how like um, uh, organisms uh, predators control uh, prey populations or prey or uh, or organisms will be subject to disease and uh, parasites in this sort of poetic way as if it's beautiful when these organisms could potentially be suffering and I think that's quite uh, problematic and that that's even coming from my sort of more of a social ecologist perspective because uh, Murray Butchkin for example he would not uh, consider the suffering of wild animals to be suffering he argued that because uh, it's relatively um, short-lived uh, even though if it's intense and it's not really um, conscious suffering that we it would be insulting to even call it suffering but 
I disagree with that because not all deaths are sort of swift deaths in nature and that there is prolonged suffering. And I don't think uh, the ability to sort of consciously think about your suffering and, and the denial of your liberty is necessarily that uh, something that accentuates the pain of, yeah, yeah, sort of animals they still, and uh, sentient beings, they do still suffer greatly from just simply these physical but devastatingly painful ailments of being literally um, uh, killed by other animals or by disease or made very ill, at least, and injured. Um, but again, moving into this sort of idea of social ecology, uh, yeah, again, it's sort of... Carlson has this very environmentalist sort of view that, in the way she talks about nature, about, like, how... Um, we all sort of, uh, it, it, it all exists to be sort of exploited, but well not exploited, she wouldn't have used that term, but used by man, and then things that even though she says about the aesthetic, even when she talks about the aesthetic pleasures, it's sort of, oh, it's aesthetically beneficial to man, like, um, we enjoy hearing birds, uh, sorry, I, I, I've used man as a stand-in for humanity, she do, uh, Carson does this in the book a lot, and that's probably why I'm doing it, I do apologise, uh, humanity uh, sort of, uh, enjoys, um, the singing of birds, which is, yeah, where the title comes from, like, Silent Spring, it's because no birds are going to be singing in spring if they're all dead from pesticides, uh, but, yes, and then, um, it's really, um, sort of quite unfortunate that she doesn't really understand, because, uh, I feel like, uh, from a more of a social ecologist, like, we have to understand that, um, uh, this sort of idea that we, we're exploiting and taking resources from nature, even though nature does naturally just provide an abundance, and then it's provided abundance via uh, humanity, who've managed to come up with brilliant innovations to uh, produce production, even though we... we um, and that's not even, like, mass industrialised agriculture, like, that's just simple uh, modifications to our uh, surroundings. Um, uh, yeah, and, but this idea of dominating nature, it, it, well, as Butch King would argue, it comes from our idea of dominating each other, but then there's this idea that even when you understand that you're part of nature, uh, you're, you're sort of in this hierarchical relationship where you're not, you're, you're forcing your own desires upon natural world and even when this understanding that instead we're sort of we could be playing this role where we're sort of enhancing the complexity and diversity of nature instead we try to sort of suppress it for our own benefit even though um full through the full development of the natural environment which could be consciously planned by people um well not entirely planned but worked with if you understand what i'm trying to say uh, but the full development of nature is uh, a sort of a necessity uh, of the full development of nature including humanity is ne a ne uh, but not exclu uh, exclusively regarding humanity is a necessary condition for the full development of humanity and by extinction uh, by extension every individual within humanity same as the condition uh, for liberty for every individual is the liberty for um every other individual and uh that's that's a perspective that I, f I feel as if uh carson uh misses and then it does sort of lead to this sort of dangerous idea of sort of it being okay to damn it, even though she would probably argue quite strongly against it but the idea it's okay to exploit uh nature um if it's uh, beneficial to mankind, or it leads then into sort of, and I think this is something that Carson would have been more sympathetic to, even though she does understand the need for humanity's interaction with the uh, so-called natural environment, but uh, this idea that nature's uh, pr uh, this pristine thing that cannot be touched by man, though um, Carson doesn't really fall into this trap, and this is the other thing that I found interesting, is she, uh, there doesn't seem to be so much of a stigma regarding invasive species in um, Carson's uh, Silent Spring. 
as there would be nowadays. Like, she constantly cites invasive species as a solution to, like, controlling pests instead of pesticides. And I haven't actually done a research on a lot of things she said, but I do know that uh, simply from leading round, uh, reading around and uh, watching videos and listening to stuff, that um, the natural, uh, that invasive species are... Uh, shouldn't necessarily always be considered invasive they should be considered invasive if they're actively harmful to an ecosystem and if they're quite persistent and uh, spread quite rapidly but if they if they're not really harmful and they're just um not naturally there then that can actually be quite a um uh labeling them as uh as invasive can actually then cause harm to the ecosystem because you try to get rid of them and then you're disrupting new sort of uh, chains in the local sort of food webs that have been created and um, you are sort of kind of uh, semi-consciously perpetuating these idea that um, only natives are allowed which of course is quite a xenophobic thing especially when you then extend it forward upon to um humans which is uh, quite an unfortunate uh thing to do and i would certainly uh, not advocate that um and i yeah in fact, i would instead advocate the abolishment of borders but that's um a topic for another time i suppose uh but yeah i find it interesting how she then understands that in face it in non-native species are not necessarily harmful and they can be beneficial and then even, like, um, I suppose she sort of uses it as the idea of sort of reactionary introductions of um, uh, non-native species. Reactionary not meaning, like, um, uh, uh, right-wing, but um, reacting to a situation. Like, uh, reactive as opposed to uh, proactive, I suppose. Yeah, reactive measures, I suppose. And then uh, would be the better term. And then the idea of sort of oh, we've accidentally um, introduced a, um, uh, a harmful uh, species that's eating all these food crops. Uh, so we'll introduce uh, the predator from its um, original um, geographic area. And then, yeah, I think it's good that it's sort of less sort of against invasive. I still feel like there's the need for caution, of course, to make sure we understand the effects that releasing this predator over, for example, even if the, if, even if the, like, if the prey item's invasive, that doesn't necessarily mean that the predator, they'll sort of balance each other out. The predator, you could end up having, uh, maybe suppressing the one and the other continuing as an invasive or even just then being left with two invasive species or, um, and then I think also you need to take into consideration the welfare of the effective effective uh, affected organisms like you do need to kind of uh you can't really do it quantitatively because uh suffering and stuff and benefits are s subjective but you do need to sort of uh weigh up wh whether the sort of the predation of this um uh well i'll use the term of pest species even though i'm not too fond of that term uh, the control of this pest species uh, is a sufficient uh, garnerer of pleasure and sort of alleviation of suffering um, in order to sort of make up for the uh, suffering that will be inflicted via the predation. I suppose I'm probably not the best example of social ecologist there. I sounded a bit like a... Um, uh, what's it called, a, a utilitarian, which I know um, uh, Butchkin was very critical of in the ecology of freedom. But, yeah, I suppose that's nearly everything that I really wanted to discuss. I, I think that Carson is a beautiful writer, as in she, write, uh, she writes beautifully, and she did raise a very important issue, and it sort of did put ecology into the social perspective and sort of lead to a lot of different fields and branches of thought which have now sort of succeeded 
uh, Carson's thoughts. Like we have social ecology now sort of alleviating the flaws, but we also have deep ecology that came out of it that gave a bunch of other unique perspectives. And it's been interesting to sort of see the development of the environmental movement. Like I've seen a Silent Spring as a recommended book alongside um, uh, a Sand County Almanac as sort of the definitive reading for um, aspiring ecologists and conservationists because it is just a very good example of a good book and I think she sort of by getting scientist verification sh shown reliability even though I don't necessarily uh, agree with the trustworthy of all things um some people did like uh, even people who supported the book did, would at times uh, say that she might be overly dramatic but I think actually yeah to say that I think in the introduction uh, Shackleton talks about how um, he spoke, I don't think he names the ecologist, but he says a prominent uh, British ecologist said that Carson's work, like, at the time was overdramatic, but in, um, yeah, but in te uh, 10 years' time from then, it would be considered an understatement, and I think that really does show. But I think this idea of sort of, the I think what was really crucial was this sort of understanding that even though the idea wasn't taken further enough for like and really understood as man being, uh, uh, as humanity. Sorry, I've done that so many times. Uh, as humanity being inherently a part of nature, uh, she did sort of get this idea that we're connected to it, even though though the idea that we're not necessarily a separate dominating entity, or a um, separate harmful and ne uh, separate necessarily harmful. I'm not going to dispute that humanity especially now, can um, be uh, harmful. Uh, but we're not necessarily harmful, and that we are just a part of the natural environment, and there's there's no real distinction between the natural and the human. But, uh, yeah, she had this... She was the one of the first authors... Well, she wasn't the first, actually, to write about pesticides, but uh, so maybe one of the most influential people in sort of... The modern environmentalist deep ecology and even probably social ecology movements and in this idea of uh, humanity being connected and uh, benefiting from the natural environment and not necessarily destroying it or needing to um, wrestle with it as Mark said but instead uh, instead um, uh, continue to sort of protect it and care for it uh and yeah not necessarily just clear everything out for um industrialization and stuff like that but and then yeah uh and then i think it would have been interesting as well if maybe animal welfare was explored because she does have a very sympathetic attitude like she describes the suffering of animals in different situations and especially like well, it's more so the suffering when it's caused by man via the pesticides. But she, she, uh, she, yeah, she'll talk about the suffering then, and then she does it, as I said, she's a very poetic writer. Uh, so that is a very powerful on it. It's just a shame that she didn't expand that upon maybe the natural suffering. Well, I, I keep on saying, like, oh, no, um, yeah, it's all natural. And then I use natural to say stuff that is just as natural as everything else, but um, sort of wild animal sort of suffering. It's a shame she didn't apply it to wild animal suffering. And I think maybe if uh, she lived to see the sort of wild animal suffering movement build up, she might have been supportive of it. But I think, yeah, the sort of context around the book and then this sort of idea of a uh, thing, it sort of is very, even if she wasn't a prominent feminist author or a feminist theorist or activist, she, through sort of her experiences, she did sort of become a role model for many um, feminist movements, particularly eco-feminism. So, yeah, I suppose I'm just going to mutter if I continue to speak. So, yeah, thank you for listening to this uh, brief discussion. Well, it's brief, but it's 15 minutes, but... Uh, unthorough discussion, I suppose, is the better term. Um, thank you for listening i'm not too fussed about marketing so if you want to sort of subscribe or like or whatever i'm not too sure what platform i'll upload this to yet um then go ahead and do so but i'm that's my intention is not to get this to as many people but rather to sort of 
benefit people by just sort of having this resource available so if you share it that would be beneficial and greatly appreciated but what i probably might appreciate more or would appreciate in any case is um sort of your feedback your criticisms so maybe comments with those that would be greatly appreciated i'll be very grateful for that so uh yeah this was my sort of first sort of attempt at a sort of video audio type ramble uh, and like I said, it's been very informal. I've just sort of been rambling and I've had a few notes in front of me. I forgot even to take the book itself up with me uh, in front of my computer. But yes, thank you for listening. Goodbye.